everyone, my name is Luna and today we're talking about everything that happened in episode 108 of campaign 3 of Critical Role, Looming. A word I will never hear again without wanting to throw up a little. If you're looking for a blow-by-blow -blow recap, make sure that you are subscribed because I've got one coming your way on Wednesday. This week we saw Bell's Hells once again in a bit of a cluster of, <laughs> of shenanigans as they attempted to follow through with their plan to deceive the emissary and the guards into believing that lewdness had turned on them. And you left the emissary alive. So far. Oh, I'll take care of him. It will be my great pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> this felt like such a classic D&D game of like, ah, what the hell do we do? And I really appreciated all of the shenanigans, particularly when they tried to stage little plays to convince them. Okay. Ready? Okay. Action. Cure wounds. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Delay. Oh, I would have gone away. Are you sorry? Oh, I would have killed all of you. Oh, silly. And and back back and back and back 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 Grandchildren. <laughs> right. This felt like some basement orgy level bullshit and I found it extremely hilarious. I love how Liam, like in character as Aurum, was like, there's no way this is going to work. But Liam clearly found the idea so funny and just couldn't help but go along with it. It's crazy to think about how many times they attempted to modify the emissary uh, Cashador's memory. I think it was like five or six times, not to mention all of the Banes and silvery barbs pumped into the attempts by Laudner. If we take out the comedy of it for a moment and just think about this from the emissary's point of view, how freaking terrifying would this have been to have these people like prodding at your psyche just over and over again? If at first you don't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> I know this one. Wait, I know this one. Wait, shut up, wait. Push ah. until they stop Push moving. Push until they stop moving. <laughs> reason these Fae were so resistant is because they have the magic resistance feature, or I assume something like it, which grants advantage on saving throws against spells and other effects. That coupled with Matt's ridiculous luck rolling meant the players were just really unlucky in getting only one of them to have the modify memory spell work. I'm really glad that Matt rolled in front of the table for these because if he'd rolled behind the screen, I'm pretty sure the critical roll is scripted folks would be out in full force. I noticed Matt rolled in front of the screen a lot more than usual this episode, which I really like. This is something that Brennan does quite often in Dimension 20, using the Box of Doom for like high stakes rolls. Yeah, we'll say he has uh, advantage. Uh, uh, you need to beat oh! a Matt 20. I'm gonna go. Uh, <laughs> I, you, got, you don't need Skin me here, right? I'm trapped it. in a video uh, game. And that's die number crazy. one. Rolled a die got number it. one. Ten. ten. That's, that's ten. half of a Nat 20. <laughs> half All the way up to a Nat 20. Rolling behind the screen definitely has its place and I think I will always choose to roll behind the screen most of the time, but there is something just so exciting about everyone seeing the dice roll together. This isn't related to the episode, but I'll take any excuse to show it off. I actually made my own box of doom. Hold on, hold on. This has been dubbed the box of bloom and I, I just love doing high stakes rolls in it. It's so exciting. So yeah, I really recommend doing it every so often in your game. Anyway, back to the episode. There were a lot of really big plays in this episode, and the first one I want to talk about is Aram's choice to kill Zathuda. Within 15 feet, right? You are within 15 feet. I am? Yeah. I'm going to attack uh, Sorrow Lord. Zathuda. Yeah. OK. Uh, it's range attack. He is unconscious. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say kill? it's disadvantage. I mean, yeah. better dead than get away. Yeah. Yeah. I really want Aurum to talk about this moment more because it clearly has affected him deeply, as evidenced by his brief conversation with Lordna. You all right? Nah, but does it matter? We know that Aurum has a difficult history with his own biological father, Tarantel, who abandoned Aurum and his family. Aurum instead formed a relationship with Derig, who he viewed as his actual father. This is kind of mirrored in Fern's experience of fatherhood too. She was abandoned, whether willingly or not, by two fathers, Oli and Zathuda, and had a different father figure in her life. When you think of your, the word father, who do you think of? Nana Mori. I feel like this whole encounter with Zathuda has probably brought up a lot of feelings for Aram regarding his own biological father, and I wonder if he is currently reflecting on how he would feel if he got a chance to speak to Tarantel. I said last week, or I don't know, maybe it was the week before, that it felt like we were seeing Aram kind of on a bit more of an upswing now that the group has a purpose and a plan, but I fear that this incident may set him back again. It's clear he's getting frustrated with the groups flip-flopping on whether or not Pradathos should be released, you know, and or controlled by them. None of you can tell me what will happen if one of our friends does what Ludness wants to do. None of you have any evidence, proof, 
Intuition doesn't cut it. Your gut does not cut it. You are putting the population of this world at risk. So I hope you are all fucking sure at the end of that road. I'll be there to get you there. I'll stand by your side. I will do my damnness to keep you all alive. But don't let it be a coin toss. Or let's see what happens, because you just don't know. I think it was Lordner who said, you know, they're not making any decisions and they're just discussing things, which is true. But I can completely understand Aram getting frustrated or angry because he's been solidly on the, you know, why are we even considering these options side for pretty much the entire campaign. I'm glad that Imogen at least does seem to be siding with him, but is also kind of being practical in saying that if Predathos is released, even after they attempt to stop it, she will try and control it. I know some critters are finding Arm to be a little annoying or like overly righteous, but personally, I think Liam is doing a fantastic job of role playing just a regular person who's gotten caught up in something far greater than they ever expected. Another big play that we saw this episode was Fern managing to tame Gloomglut, even if just for a little while. And it bites out and grabs the edge of your armor and picks you up. Circles once, <laughs> goes and rests in this tight curled circle and places you right in the center of its coiled body, its tail wrapping around. Oh, this is my dream. <clears throat> ah, yes, Fern's massively high persuasion coming in clutch. This moment has been a long time coming because ever since Fern saw Gloom Clutch, she has wanted him as a pet. But I really loved the moment at the end of the episode where she freed him from the, his restraints and said she was going to let him go. I think from a practical standpoint, this is a good move. I mean, I don't know how the players would roll around with a fey dragon everywhere they go. I mean, Trinket was bad enough until they got the little like Pokeball necklace. But also from a narrative perspective, I think there is something really beautiful about Fern letting Gloom Glut and with him, maybe the unresolved feelings about her biological father go. And I kind of imagine it will end up being a bit like Baldur's Gate, maybe. Perhaps at the end, Gloomglut will swoop in and join the fight because of his connection to Fern. That would be really neat. Please place your predictions in the comments for how long you think it's going to take Critical Role to get a Gloomglut plushie in the store, though. Like, can you imagine? I mean, Gloomglut's design is kind of wild. I think it would look pretty hilarious as a plushie. Shout out to Dyla Walpole, the artist who designed the mini. It's just absolutely wonderfully horrifying stuff. And speaking of wonderfully horrifying stuff. And you watch as these strips of flesh are pulled out. They're then grabbed by other arms to begin to weave them into a tapestry-like singular piece of fabric and stretching them and pulling them off to different hooks at the sides. You watch as what looks to be like a frame, like a hexagonal frame is built, lowered, and then what's built from his matter is stretched across it. What remains of the pale <laughs> skin of Sorrow Lord Zathuda I throw up. Uh, <laughs> uh, has been now turned into a three by three foot hexagonal art piece with his face in the center of it stretched. Eyeless. <laughs> 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 I mean, Matthew Mercer has come up with some pretty fucked up shit in his time, but this was pr pretty fucked up shit. I mean, we were under no illusions of who Nanamori is, but there is something about just seeing it right there. I've only watched a handful of episodes of Doctor Who, but the one that I remember the most is with this person thing. Honestly, after seeing what happened to Zathuda, I think the Emissary got a pretty good deal being turned into a Topiary. I think I would much rather that. I was just totally with Imogen on this one. I barfed down there, I threw up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I absolutely saw it. I just wasn't gonna make a big deal about it. Dory, that shit was nasty. It was pretty <laughs> horrible. I mean, I asked to see the loom, but I thought it would be something different. Like a, like a loom. Yeah, like Not a loom like loom. A like I th yeah, maybe in nice blanket or Where the fuck are, what is happening? I have no <laughs> idea, but I'm just rolling with it. The only upside to this is that if Fern does want to talk with us either, she has the option to now, I guess, which we actually did see happen a little bit. You don't know me at all. Now you're not gonna get a chance to. I know what you are. You were just another person looking for power. Even if you had to step on your family to get there. I don't like that very much. 
really happy to see Fern take this stance with her biological father. I was actually just talking about this on stream earlier this week. Not care about her in the slightest. He cares about her as an ends to a mean. He has never met her in her life until she's become relevant to his power machination machinations. Like, he doesn't care about her at all. So there's no way he would change his entire worldview based on this person that he sees as disposable and, you know, like, he sees her as a tool to get what he wants. So I would be extremely surprised if we ever see Zathuda uh, displaying any sense of humanity or affection for Fern, to be honest. <laughs> During that stream, actually, someone brought up a really great theory around Nanamori and Zathuda. Let me, hold on, let me pull that up real quick. Yes, so Pi in the live chat, hello Pi, theorized that since Zathuda purposefully orchestrated things with Fern so that she would be ruidus born, perhaps Zathuda made a deal with Nanamari to keep Fern in her domain until she was old enough and powerful enough to become a vessel for Pradathos. Because we know that Fern was kept in Nanamari's domain for close to 90 years, when for Fern's parents it had only been six years. So Zathuda may have made a deal with Nana to keep Fern there, to age her up, ready for the coming Apogee Solstice, and in all that time Nana grew to love Fern and view her as her granddaughter and this could explain her dislike of Zathuda and the Unseelie if she decided that she didn't want Fern to be caught up in their machinations. If this theory is true I do wonder how Fern would react if it's ever revealed because while she didn't seem to be bothered by Nana's keeping her there when she found out she doesn't seem to like that the Unseelie has been attempting to manipulate her so it could change how she sees things. Anyway I don't know let me know what you think about this theory in the comments because I thought it was pretty juicy. And another theory I want to talk about is one that quite a few of you in my comments believe which is that the Arch Heart, as we saw them in episode 107, was actually the Lord of Lies, Lord of the Hells, Asmodeus. The Lord of the Hells has a history of appearing as others. We saw it in Calamity and we also saw it in Downfall, so there is some precedent there. However, I think the Arch Heart was truly the Arch Heart, and I'll tell you why. Abubakar seemed to really connect with his character, Salaha, and conversely the Archheart in Downfall, and I think it would be strange to have him come in and not play that character. Personally, I think if we're going to have Asmodeus masquerading as another god, Matt would have picked a different god, such as the Moonweaver, a god, you know, that would make sense for them to have a temple dedicated to them in the Feywild, and... <laughs> Marigold. And he would have done that interaction himself. In fact, I can really see a fun situation where Matt plays a god like the Moonweaver, but when it was revealed that it was actually Asmodeus, Brennan came to the table to play him. I mean, that would be excellent. But yeah, I think it just seems too convoluted to have Abubaka playing the Arch Heart, but actually playing Asmodeus. Also, to add to this, in the cooldown, Abubaka talked a lot about how the Arch Heart's state of mind is, and I don't know, he seemed very personally connected to that character. They even talked about how Abu was the one who came up with the Arch Heart's plan as Matt reached out to ask him you know how he thought that the god would respond to unfolding events and I think that that shows there's so much great benefit to collaborating and it's something I hope that we see more of in the narrative as we've seen in the books. Now of course actors are as we all know professional liars so I will remain as slightly suspicious of Abu Bakr because he is an incredibly talented actor and more than capable of pulling the wool over all of our eyes but yeah I think for now I'm gonna have to disagree with this theory but please let me know what you think of it in the comments. All right I want to take a moment to say thank you so much to everyone who has left kind words about my return to making these videos. These comments always lift my spirits and I'm very happy to be back too. Um, I'm feel like things have just really improved a lot for me in terms of my mental health and my physical health. And so it's really, really fun to be back to making these videos. So thank you. All right, until next time, bye. Okay. These babies. Hello. Hi.